Micro TV. This is Tweevo. This week in Evolution. Episode number 96. Recorded on December 21st, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. <laughs> Joining me today, as you can see on my chin here. <laughs> <laughs> From Salt Lake City, <laughs> Nels LD. <laughs> Got the names too it. high up. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Fantastic. Yeah. Good preview you know, there. I started the live stream last night. Mm -hmm. Instead of my name, I had Paul because I had Paul B. Oh. Nash as a guest oh. last time. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. I go what? for 20 minutes until someone tells me, hey, Vincent, you know, you got Paul. <laughs> Chain, did you do a name change? Yeah, exactly. I did. Yep. It's very easy to do. How are you, you doing, go. Nels? Yeah. Doing well. <clears throat> Greetings from LD Lab Studios. Good to be with you. And um, I'm excited for uh, today's podcast as we, episode 96, we're approaching triple digits. We're doing our um, semi traditional near holiday podcast here. <laughs> near holiday. <laughs> Short, uh, well, actually, it is a holiday. Winter, winter solstice, right? The shortest That's right. Day 21st, of the year. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we're, hopefully, we'll bring some, some light. Um, to the occasion, um, I guess to our listeners in the more northern latitudes, uh, hoping you've cultivated some brightness uh, since it's sort of a dark time of the year and are celebrating the uh, increase in, in daylight coming. So you're out on the eastern seaboard, Vincent, but it doesn't look like you're at the incubator. Where where are you right I'm now? In, I'm in the Washington D.C. area for a couple of days for mm -hmm. a meeting, and um, I understand that you had a lot of snow there, right? A fair amount, yeah. So we're off to a good. We got off to a good start in December. The, the resorts, the mountains in particular, got mm. uh, uh, some significant <clears throat> totals, which have been a, uh, really good for getting the terrain open for skiing and related outdoor activities. In the valley, actually, we haven't had a, a lick of snow. It's been warmer, including today. So the sun's out, and um, uh, we're uh, well above freezing at the moment. Uh, there might be a storm coming though, right? Uh, kind of later mm. this weekend, maybe you know, right in time for uh, um, the proverbial white Christmas, as they say, at least in the mountains. But we'll see. Speaking of snow, Vincent, I know that you were recently um, surrounded over in Germany for the giant virus meeting I by was, some pretty yeah. major storms. I'd love to hear a little bit yeah, more about it. Let, me, let yeah. me show you a picture. Here we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see if this will work. Yeah, look at that. There we go. Wow, wow. This is, uh, I can make it a little smaller, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. So mm -hmm. this is... Uh, the giant virus meeting and <coughs> excuse me, it's at Ringberg Castle, which is just outside of um, Tegernsee. <coughs> excuse me. And, yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, you can see we had a lot of snow. We had a couple of feet of snow, as you can see here. And these are all the participants. There I am over there in uh, on the left side. <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, yeah, I see you. I can see you over there. Let me let me get the the pointer in the right place. Well, I can't. It's over here. <clears throat> you see the guy with the the green. I do. Yep. And if you go f to the right of of him, then you can see me there in the black coat. About, yeah, about five over. And then if you over. keep going, mm -hmm. um, let's see, about halfway down, mm -hmm. Matthias is uh, kind of peeking out behind the guy with the blue jacket. Oh, yeah, I see him. It's Matthias yeah, Fisher who, who organized the meeting. <clears throat> and then yeah. um, we have Dave Dunnigan. You can see he's really tall in the back. And then next to him is Jim, <laughs> Jim Van Etten. Oh, yeah. Uh, Eugene Kunin is, is a little bit to the right of me. He doesn't have a coat on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, it was a great meeting. And... Um, mm. uh, I know, see it. It's small. It's a small meeting. Your, your postdoc yeah. was there. Right. Yeah. Katie Dietz. Yeah. So right. I was really hoping to make it um, just couldn't kind of make it work on my calendar. I ended up I did a brief stint in Seattle uh, giving seminars at the Department of Microbiology and then the Department of Genome Sciences sort of back to back. Um, and the timing just ended. I had committed to that and sort of kind of blundered up my calendar. But Katie made it. She was <clears throat> she had a blast, super inspired um, by that community and the sort of both inspirational work, but also the encouragement, sort of the positivity, the support. I think that, that combination can be pretty rare and, and is really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good community. Yeah. 
I agree. So <laughs> I, a, I, I heard it's they're not at the level of backstabbing yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's the magic of a small community. If someone discovers something cool, everyone's like, oh, my God, this is this is really great. And so, I, yeah, I love that meeting. Was there a couple times ago before the pan, right before the pandemic? We, yeah. 2019, we there. you, you and yeah. uh, Rich and I did a TWIV, yeah. a TWIV yeah. right? It was really good. Really good. And then you, I also, I saw that you did sort of, you put a TWIV up just a day or two ago with Matthias Fisher, the organizer That's right. of the meeting. That's right. So I, yeah. I, I went to Heidelberg where Matthias is at the Max Planck. We did a TWIV, a TWIV about his work, which involves giant viruses, which infect protists. And yeah. the, the cool observation that there are these virophages that can interfere with giant virus replication, mm -hmm. and they yeah. integrate into the host. And when the giant virus infects, they get induced and they interfere with the giant virus replication. It's like an immune system, right? Yeah, I know it. I can't get, I can't get enough of this. And, and here's right. the cool part, Nels. <clears throat> so I asked him, you know, how widespread are these virophages in protist mm -hmm. genomes? He said, well, yeah, that's yeah. interesting you should ask. I don't know if you got to this part in the podcast yet. Not, not yet. I'm about halfway in, yeah. He yeah. said, all the sequence assemblies throughout the virophages, because they're repetitive, and they thought it's a virus sequence, it's repetitive, we're going to throw it out. So he and his colleague looked in the, 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 uh, the read archive, right, yeah. where everything yeah. is, and they found the virophages in, in multiple protist genomes, which just shows you it's all about how to use your tools, right? That's right. Yeah, dumpster diving here in this case. Don't uh, be careful what you throw away in those vast heaps of sequencing data. There's some gems in there. That's a new perfect example. And he said now, <clears throat> it's not as much of a problem now, <clears throat> excuse me, because people are doing longer read sequencing, right? Yep, yep. So yep. you don't have that issue where you have to deal with a repetitive virus-like sequence. He said, but before, you know, the Minion, Minion, yep. uh, it was really hard because you had 30, 40 base reads and, and the, the programs couldn't deal with it. That's right. Yeah, discerning whether it's a technical artifact or how do how does how does that repetitive sequence hang together or does it not? It yeah. was a huge challenge. Still pretty challenging, but you're right. The technology of long read has really um, made that a much easier task. That that like has saved our bacon on a number of occasions and is part yeah. of our ongoing efforts as well. Yeah, I, I would Man. tell people listen to the Matthias. Yes, yes. I mean Matthias is really good at explaining things, and the yep. science is fascinating. I mean, it's yeah. not doing well this episode, okay, in terms of, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, why. but the yeah. he's, he's so good. Just listen to yeah. it. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. That was my uh, first holiday recommendation as our uh, listeners have some time, hopefully to take a break in the next few weeks, dial that one up, listen to Matthias. He's so clear in the way he communicates. Just so uh, totally, totally yeah, clear. just really next level in terms of, and also of, his career, has been very interesting. He was, I mean, he went to Curtis yep. Suttle, Suttle's lab in Vancouver, which was perfect at the beginning of the giant virus era, right? Yep. And, yep. Um, you know, he was trying to grow up stocks of Crow-V, right? Crow, cafeteria Romburgensis virus. Mm -hmm. He couldn't grow them up because they were full of the virophages, <laughs> which yeah. is called Ma virus, by the way. Now, yep. it, and here's a story that is not on the TWIV. So mm. Ma virus, they called it Ma virus because it's related to the maverick transposons that are known to exist in cells, right? They're called mavericks. So they yep. called it ma-virus. Mm -hmm. There's a card game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna look it up for you. It's mm -hmm. called Netrunner, okay? Uh -huh, uh -huh. There's this card game called Netrunner. You remember magic uh, yeah. cards, right? <clears throat> yeah. Same idea. So there's a card called ma-virus. The, some guy who made the cards, he, he found Ma virus and he named the card. <laughs> and it's got a picture of Ma virus on, on the front. Wow, and so, wow. so Matthias got an email a few weeks ago from this guy. He said, how do you pronounce Ma virus? <laughs> <laughs> and so Matthias sent him a little audio file. Huh? Ma, it's, it's pronounced Ma virus because it could be a number of different yeah, yeah. iterations, right? Ma mm -hmm. virus. Mavirus, it's ma virus. <clears throat> and the guy made a little video on YouTube where he says, I, I found the guy who discovered this and he told me how to pronounce it. And here he is. <laughs> That's so good. Anyway, yeah. so the funny thing is, <clears throat> Curtis walks up to us at the meeting 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he starts talking about the virus, and he pronounces it totally differently. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's Matthias right. said to him, Curtis, I discovered it. I get the name. <laughs> that's great. And Curtis is like, no, no. <laughs> I, fu- I funded it. <laughs> it was yeah, right. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, right, let, wow. me, uh, let, me, let me welcome everyone. Please, uh, we, let's do that. We've gone a few minutes into this without saying hello. Uh, I want to welcome our moderators. Les is here today. Uh, Tom is here today. Barb Mack is here. Good to see Great. you. Welcome all. Um, Steph is here as well. Great. So, uh, some of you were at the live stream last night, so thank you so much for coming back. Yeah. Uh, so thank, thank you, Mods, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, let's see who's who's besides our moderators. Wh- where's everyone from? Tell us, okay? We'd like to know. Yeah, um, let's pull up a few banners here and and say hello from around the world. So I know that uh, Claire is from the UK. There you go. <clears throat> Welcome. Let's move it up a bit. Claire is from the UK. Tom is in Eugene, Oregon today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Um. People are making banana jokes already. Yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> uh, uh, where else are we from? Germany? Oh, Frankfurt, Abilash. Uh, there we go. Abilash was on last night, and I flew through Frankfurt to get to the giant virus. Right. Movie, of course. Um, <laughs> Dodge some major snowstorms. MK is in eastern Massachusetts. <clears throat> no, no, <clears throat> no canine content today. Sorry. Not today. Not, not today. We're <clears> going <throat> to the time. plants. Yep. <sighs> Where else? Ontario, Canada. Welcome. Giant virus meeting sounds dangerous. No, actually, it's quite nice. Pretty safe. Relatively, uh, virologically speaking. Pueblo, Colorado. Hello. Lisa's is in Columbus, Ohio. Great. Um, and um, welcome, Lise. Jan is from San Diego. <clears throat> Elizabeth is in West Virginia. Little Joe is in Ireland. Welcome, welcome. <clears throat> Oh, Schloss Ringberg. Yeah, that's the name of the mm-hmm. <laughs> the castle where the giant virus meeting is from. Ziziva is in Denver. David is in Alameda, California. Duncan is from North Wales. And there you go. Fantastic. Well, welcome, everyone. We've got a great session underway with folks from all over the world. I really appreciate everyone joining us. And I think we've got a really fun topic. It's not on canines, it's not on dogs, but <clears throat> um, two plants that um, have uh, certainly touched all of our lives. And so we're going to give it the Tuivo treatment. What are the origins and evolutions of two really vital crop species? The first is corn. And the second, as um, noted in the chat, is bananas. Um, this is a rare Tuivo doubleheader for us, Vincent. We um, <laughs> We had uh, 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 an interesting sort of uh, double paper uh, show up. The themes are actually really overlapping, and so I think it actually makes a ton of sense to to bring both of, in the spirit of comparative genomics in order to understand evolution, to compare these two papers, actually. I think we're going to have a really fun conversation. Um, and, you know, we'll, let's set this up kind of from an evolutionary standpoint, and uh, everyone who is here, don't be shy about um, getting into the conversation early and often as it relates to, um, you know, some, I think the evolution of these plants that really, again, sort of, it's, it goes beyond just the genetics here and into how we think about um, our sources of food and, and where these things come from, how we sort of select for them, et cetera. Okay, so um, first let's set the table here. So the first paper, two tiacentes made modern maize. This showed up, um, about three weeks ago, or a little less, um, uh, coming out of Jeff Ross Ibarra's lab. Um, This is in the Department of Evolution and Ecology at UC Davis, a hotbed for ecology and evolution. Actually, I think our last Twivo 95 um, considered some work out of Davis as well, uh, more on the ecological side. Um, 
here we're really going to move into and consider some population genetics as it relates to figuring out kind of the genetic uh, history, which is really interesting, controversial, um, and uh, over the, uh, decades, um, which, but I think really coming into focus in a large part because of this sort of Herculean effort by the uh, Rasa Barrow Lab and others. So some co-first authors here, uh, Ning Yang, Yubin Wang, and Zhangguo Lu. Um, and then another, you know, I won't go through the whole, uh, a, pr a pretty big cast of characters here from um, Beyond Davis as well. Um, you know, Chicago, um, some labs in China, all of the above, some really heavy lifting for genomics and then um, population genetics analysis. Um, and then our second paper, we'll, um, I think we will spend some time here uh, on the first one first, but I, I do want to um, introduce the second paper, which is emerged, I think, maybe in the following week. Um, this is from Lian Shen Zhang's lab uh, uh, in China, in Hangzhou, uh, at the uh, Zhejiang Provincial Key Laboratory of Horticulture, Plant <coughs> Integrative Biology in the College of Agriculture and Biotechnology at uh, Zhejiang University. And so that paper is titled Origin and Evolution of the Triploid Cultivated Banana Genome. And so we'll return to that first, but let's begin on the evolutionary origins of corn. And, you know, I'd say, Vincent, that um, obviously corn seems f super familiar. Uh, I'm sure most, if not all of us, have had <laughs> corn in some form or another <laughs> within the last 24 hours. Um, and but it turned and so, you know, obviously a highly dominant agricultural crop. And so it's kind of funny in some sense that, um, you know, its origins are still uh, somewhat mysterious. Mm -hmm. A uh, long-running case of artificial selection. So, you know, uh, where humans have influenced the, uh, the evolutionary course here in the, in the last thousands of years um, as agriculture, as farming, has really come to a fore um, uh, with our own species. So, you know, we have some other examples I wanted to point to on Twebo of cases of kind of human-influenced evolution. Uh, the pigeons of Mike Shapiro, a very early episode of Twebo, uh, how breeders have really pushed the morphological traits there. Um, totally different are... Uh, um, Actually, not completely different, but, you know, so there's some really fancy um, uh, varieties of corn that are just for have been selected for aesthetic reasons. We, you know, like these gem kernels, we might actually, you know, harken back a little bit to, um, you know, also the, the scientific impact of maize of corn. When we think about Barbara McClintock's really pioneering work on jumping genes, which turn out to be the discovery of transposable elements and how they work. These were all these patterns in the kernels that were really um, beautiful just for just to look at and sort of um, also underline you know how humans select things that they just think look cool pigeons are an example the dogs the canines are another example that we've made some glancing blows in terms of thinking about the um, evolutionary origins and diversity of dogs around the world as well so um, turns out so the prevailing model on kind of where corn came from from an evolutionary standpoint was the notion of um, this single domestication event from a wild grass um, and this is in the genus Z, spelled Z-E-A, also a common name Tiacente. Um, and I think you put in a nice uh, link here to the to native seeds, the ancestor corn Z maize. Um, and then there are yeah. these specific species um, that will be that will really be sort of the stars of the show today. One is called uh, Parvaglumis, and the other is Mexicana. That's sort of the new surprise entrance into the into the mm -hmm. story here. Um, is the second one that the um, Ross Barrow Lab um, brings brings to the, the forefront. Um, but in the whole 20th century, and championed mainly by sort of one of the giants of genetics, a fellow called George Beadle, um, he had really sort of was effective at propagating the notion that it was a single, um, you know, wild grass cultivar in that genus of Z, Z maize, M-A-Y-S, um, that uh, was domesticated that then you know farmers primitive farmers um, started planting this purposefully to grow it for food is the, the corn kernels um, but you know the authors point out that this ignored a lot of evidence about actually the geography of where you find um, the specific cultivar that beetle and others were sort of um, connecting to the to the origin story of corn and even like a lot of um, archaeologic data um, so people have been uh, corn, people have been saving corn or have been saving tiacente as it's become maize um, for thousands of years. And so there are, there, you know, there's a really kind of rich archaeologic record 
or you can see the morphology of what corn looked like uh, along the way. Smaller ears of corn, um, fewer kernels per cob, etc. Um, and also, you know, really a kind of a weirdo in terms of the reproductive strategy. When you look at the like the ears of corn, it doesn't kind of line up that to just um, put it in the wild grass family. Something else is going on here um, in this sort of course of artificial selection. And actually, you know, I was thinking about this a little bit um, just kind of in before our show, Vincent. But I, I think we have to be like the, I'm kind of thinking about letting go of that term artificial selection. I mean, he, this is human influenced selection. Mm -hmm. Sure. But but <laughs> we're, we're part where I don't think we should hold ourselves separate from nature. We're part we're, we're part of. So it doesn't not, you know, it doesn't feel like natural selection. But the same way, you know, a cheetah decides which caribou to hunt. We would call we were comfortable calling that natural selection as it impacts then the offspring, you know, potentially in that ecosystem. However, mm -hmm. when humans are, you know, deciding which um, plants to interbreed over the course of thousands of years. Also, you know, pr probably pretty close to natural selection, human influence selection, maybe is a better stand in for artificial selection. Well, I think, um, whatever, I think whatever we do is, is part of evolution, no matter how artificial you may view it, right? It, yeah, it yeah. affects other living things. And so I think that's fine. Yeah. You know, you know, there's a great story about almonds, right? I don't know if you read the book, um, sapiens i haven't yet yeah it's on my menu yeah yeah yeah. so yeah. almonds you know the ancient almonds were toxic they're they have right poison yeah. in them and so <clears throat> the way humans <laughs> figured out you can you get variants of almonds that lose the toxin gene right and so <clears throat> there was a place where people used to defecate right away from living and one day someone saw an almond plant growing that had come from a seed that had passed through someone. So obviously that person lived. So they took yep. the seeds and those were the first mutant <laughs> nice. and then planted wow. them. And they're now from then on, they're fine. Something like that, right? <laughs> there you go. Great example. Human influenced yeah. uh, selection there. And, you know, the phenot it's interesting to kind of compare actually the phenotypes we use or the, the hints we use intuition we use in some cases to yeah. to sort of make these choices yeah really uh, well i, I mean agree. we all assume that people living tens of thousands of years ago didn't know anything but they had to survive they had to have smarts of some kind different from what we have nowadays but smarts nevertheless right to get enough food and avoid being eaten and so forth yes really sophisticated and in fact you know if any of us myself included have spent any time you know gardening um and, you know, the notion of depending on ourselves in the modern era to produce enough food to survive is almost laughable. I think, you know, I did a calculation. I grow, grow tomatoes in the summer. I did a calculation that, um, you know, if I put if I put in my um, time, effort, et cetera, um, resources, fancy <laughs> heirloom seeds, uh, water <laughs> bill, each tomato probably costs 20 bucks a piece, which is not the most financially viable. It's a great hobby, obviously. And it's just, you know, a few yeah, tomatoes yeah. for some sandwiches during the summer, but that's very different than survival or, or the sort of the agricultural um, sort of lead up here. Sure. And so that's what the, you know, and I think that's one of the really great things about this paper is that the authors kind of um, really um, weave together both that history, the archeological history, um, along with now the genetics. And so they take on this really um, big question, which is, is there more behind this than just sort of taking a wild grass, planting it again and again, interbreeding it, in, inbreeding it and planting it? And it turns out the answer is pretty clearly yes. And that's not wasn't a total surprise, but really the details here, um, I, I, I think, are. And so the um, the punchline to kind of cut to it, it's, it's already in the title of the paper, right, is two teosentes made modern maize. And so you've got that first one, which is the species um, that we mentioned, um, Parvaglumis, but then the um, species Mexicana, Zimes Mexicana, really has its moment here um, in the sun. So, and, you know, we haven't, we really haven't covered enough plant evolution, I think, as well. And so here we're kind of, we're trying to make it up for it with a two for one um, today, but I think there'll be some, you know, some really great discussion um, about why plant systems are really um, uh, super important to think about, not just kind of from a, hey, this is our food, but this is like kind of the evolutionary process is here right on display. And there's some real value um, in these systems. I'm always, you know, I'm in a department of human genetics, Vincent, and I'm mm -hmm. always saying, you know, we need to hire a plant geneticist if we're serious about 
human evolution. And I'm kind of laughed out of the room because it's like, no, you just need to figure out human diseases and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, but come on, like, this is like, this, (laughs) this is both in the origins the human influence decision making as we've moved into agriculture all the way to you know speaking of health like uh, what are we putting in our bodies every day like the, it, it covers all of the bases um to, for me for thinking about human genetics yeah uh, kind of a reflection in the mirror actually as geneticists for um for the the process of genetics and evolution in this case as well okay so anyway back to the paper so um there's already you know a lot of information kind of in the record um, as the paper takes up the topic. And so Z. maize, parvoglumis, and mexicana are, th- are, th- are species that are estimated to have diverged 30 to 60,000 years ago. And so that kind of just sets a broad framework for the timing here. Um, and you find parvoglumis in uh, lowlands in central Mexico, whereas mexicana is found in the highlands. And so what that implies that there was sort of a, as these things um, diverged, as the populations became distinct and they became separate species, species um, that there was adaptation to the highlands would be the idea in the Mexicana background. So then, um, you know, so the archaeological evidence then comes in and says, well, um, go forward and now another um, 20,000 years or so to about 6,000 years ago. Um, And that's when um, um, Tiacente was thought to be domesticated again in the lowlands, um, but brought to the highlands about in that time frame, about 60, about 6,000 years ago. So somewhere between, you know, 30,000 years to 6,000 years ago, the first Tiacente, Parvoglumis, gets domesticated, but then it spreads far and wide. They have some really cool maps in the paper that sort of um, try to put this together kind of uh, to the geography, um, spreading south, South America, and north um, in, in, uh, into what's now the U.S. Um, and then, and then, you know, eventually, obviously, around the world, as corn has come to dominate, and there are some um, some strains, or the the term for plants usually, accessions, um, is the sort of equivalent of a strain, sort of um, populations, distinct populations within a species um, that are, for example, are now kind of dominating agriculture in China, um, and they add some genomes there to ca- kind of get a comparative view as well. Um, so. There is, you know, this evidence that there's uh, maize all over, kind of um, certainly in, in Central America, South America, moving into North America. Um, and um, and in the South American strains in particular, there's actually no evidence for the admixture with Mexicana. Um, and so that's where some of, I think, the more early ideas about, um, you know, Parvoglumis sort of being the, the key ancestor or the only ancestor sort of maybe um, came to the fore. Also, it's, you know, I think it's important to remember that we've, you know, in the past, whatever, 30 years, we've undergone this genomics revolution. And so the amount of data that you can get and in, in the power of the comparisons you can make are now a lot easier. So let's talk about that for a minute. So the authors, you know, do some like roll up their sleeves here and do a lot of sequencing. I think they mentioned that they sequenced 200 and almost 270 accessions. Those are different strains of maize from across Mex- Mexico that there were sampled or collected from across Mexico. And then in the end, um, with the data they generated and other um, available data, they consider a thousand genomes of um, different maize from different maize populations. Uh, more than 300 hundred of them newly analyzed as there's just more, but the efforts of this lab and others as there's more sort of genome scale data that becomes available. And then immediately, you know, they kind of cut to the chase with a pretty good, what's called an F4 test. And so this is trying to look for um, the evidence of shared genetic drift across the test populations using sort of outgroups. So they, if you look at figure, this is in figure one, panel B, um, they've basically got the four um, kind of major groups that they're considering here. Um, yeah, and so we can uh, keep going down. That's sort of the summary. One more. Here we go. So we, there we've got the maps, um, and that's just showing the top map there, those gr- green dots. That gives you a sense of where the um, 270 geno- new genomes um, that they worked on, the red dots are ones that have been collected before. And then, yeah, in panel B, so here's the here's that mm-hmm. test, that, um, this um, population genetics test, the F4 test. So they've basically have Mexicana parvoglumis, um, and then um, yeah, use this with a comparison for the outgroup, which is called um, Diploperinus, a uh, more distant related. And then um, we won't go deep into the weeds here, but basically for um, all of the uh, strains that were recovered 
from Mexico, from the lowlands to the highlands and um, all places in between, those blue bars uh, have a, a, a statistical score that basically asks is, do you find evidence for um, uh, the sort of um, the alleles or the genetic identity of the Mexicana species? And the answer is yes, or subspecies. The answer is yes. And the one exception is this out group N16, which is one that was recovered in South America and from Peru. Um, and uh, kind of gets, uh, again, kind of as they put it together in that timeline um, with a sort of origin story from 6,000 years ago. And that one um, missed out on this um, sort of secondary um, um, interbreeding event or admixture event is the sort of term of the scientific term um, used here. Okay, so that's, you know, that kind of like kicks it off in terms of the big picture that you see admixture from Mexicana in all of these strains. And so what that does is immediately sort of revise the picture so that it was um, that original Parva glumis strain uh, from the lowlands gets domesticated, but then is brought to the highlands. Um, and there's other archeological evidence, again, that they're weaving together here um, and together with the genetic evidence that really supports the model where it goes to the highlands, they're doing all this interbreeding or admixture between Parva glumis and um, Mexicana, and then bring that back to the lowlands, and then it spreads far and wide, um, and you've got sort of that um, robust genetic contribution from Mexicana that you now see sort of in modern maize today. So they were breeding for qualities that they wanted, correct? They, whatever yeah. they were, you know, number of kernels, straightness, color, length. Uh, whatever it, we don't really know what they were looking for, but presumably oh yeah, no. all of this was part of the uh, the breeding, right? No question about it. And in fact, that's where the archaeological record really kind of weighs in on this too. So as you recover, you know, as people saved cobs, because um, you know one of the major advantages of corn as well, right, is how you can just preserve it. Um, the kernels dry out, but then you can mash them up or rehydrate them and use them. Um, and all kinds of, um, for all kinds of different varieties of food. Um, you know, lots of people just have like stocks of it and then you can kind of compare that in the archeologic record and you go from these tiny, you know, just a few kernels and including in modern Tia mm -hmm. that's wild today, all the way then to, you know, the, the sort of progression, the cobs get bigger, the kernels. And so, yeah, so that's, that was going on, you know, and this is, is a lot of intuition. This is like obviously from 6,000 years back. We're not talking about a lot of not a knowledge of genetics. The chromosomal basis of inheritance mm -hmm. isn't even sort of a glimmer in our eye yet as a species. But all of this intuition was in terms of, you know, efficiency in breeding and getting something that's like the traits that you really want. The other kind of cool, um, you know, and actually, I think we'll touch on this a bit more in the banana story um, in the domestication there is you know disease resistance becomes a trait that becomes very important uh, and so that can happen pretty naturally like if you try if you breed some pairs or inbreed like really closely related pairs for a long time for generations let's say but all of a sudden you know a fungal pathogen or something else comes in and wipes out your crops then it's sort of those few stragglers that were able to survive that because maybe they encoded a a resistant uh, immune resistance gene mm. all of a sudden mm. that becomes you know that's now that's those are the genomes that move forward and so that's certainly written into you know kind of like you're saying vincent like you know kind of almost invisibly written into that story or that history um, of corn other domesticated species kind of ha happening over the generations sort of right under our nose okay so the well, yeah the thing I, I think is very interesting is that when they at some point it just spreads Mm -hmm. within the region, within the continent, and eventually everywhere. So it must be that at some point they get some variety that has all the qualities that, that people like, and then it gets adopted elsewhere, right? Yeah, and no, I love that too, right? Yeah, it's sort of that like, um, I mean, today, right, someone posts something clever on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and then it's like, within 24 hours, millions yeah. of people have seen it, right? Uh, kind of like meme energy. Here, I think that same sort of human impulse is playing out, but over much longer time periods where if a farmer has just come up with this great, you know, uh, uh, breeding scheme where, you know, that in the admixture to Mexicana in the highlands was uh, appears to be a, a, a central or a primary example of that, 
what are they going to do? They want to share that, right? They want to show the world or show their show their their relatives and family to begin with. They'll show, yeah. and then that that sort of chain kind of propagates. And so that's yeah, that's a really important point to to um, to sort of dwell on is how not only you know is this kind of happening, but it's also replacing the other sort of the original ones as people are saying like, hey, look at this awesome version of maize. I think you'll want this one. It's not going to die because it's more disease resistant mm -hmm. or but it has twice as many kernels, like new and improved, right? It's sort of like prehistoric advertising for your um, genetic improvement here. And what's uh, really cool is that <clears throat> there are no patents. There are no big companies <laughs> holding you to pay for the <laughs> yeah. seed, right? It's just, hey, <coughs> this is yeah. a really good corn. Why don't you check it out? And yeah, yeah. give it away. Give it to your friends. It doesn't matter. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I'd love to bring in like an archaeologist <laughs> who, who might have some yeah. evidence of how these advantages were wielded, maybe not with so much generosity as we might expect, but were actually became yeah. sort of strategic advantages. What's the backstory? Maybe not so much about, hey, try this new and improved corn, but because we have this like, you know, sort of source of power, or this source mm -hmm. of energy, how have we propagated that as humans? And so, you know, all of the usual rules apply. Um, I would say that uh, stretch back both the better angels and the darker angels yeah, of human yeah. uh, history there for sure. Okay, so, um, but now from a, kind of returning to the, kind of the genetics here, right? So the authors now have this wealth, more than a thousand genomes worth of data that they can use these increasingly powerful population genetics tools to sort of understand what are the contributions here. Getting at your point, Vincent, like what are the kind of key genetic contributions that might have an impact on important beneficial traits in this domestication process. So they developed what they call, uh, or what's called an admixture graph. Um, and that's basically to, to use, uh, again, all these genome comparisons um, to say, you know, what's, what's, uh, what are the unique genetics of each of the subspecies, the, the strains, the so-called <clears throat> accessions, and then um, try to, as you kind of march through the genome, to say that, okay, in this region of the genome of maize, and it might be all of the ones sampled, that the Mexicana sort of variance, the, ver the genetic variation is sort of um, overrepresented relative to the overall kind of history of all of the genetic contributions. And so from that graph, it points to about a quarter of the genome is contributed by Mexicana. Um, and more than that, it also, so the graph, it's, um, you know, so it, it sort of starts with the different strains, has sort of solid arrows that are built off of what is thought to be the, just the overall genetic relatedness. And then based on sort of the regions of the genome that are um, overrepresented for various um, strains or, or subspecies, the Mexicana in this point play in, is part of this and several others, those are sort of the proposed admixture events that kind of explain or fit the sort of flavor of the variation that you see as you're comparing the data. And so, you know, they point out actually that other graphs that they generated um, might have a better fit statistically, sort of technically, um, but it involves a lot more admixture events um, that become less plausible when you think about the relationship between these species and also the geography of how this all played out. So it's almost like, okay, I, we can sort of reconstruct a pattern of um, these lines coming down or these species diverging, but then with um, some interbreeding between them. And, um, you know, you want that to also match actually the fact that, you know, so, you know, a contribution from a strain in Peru probably wasn't happening with a strain that's now in like whatever modern day Idaho or something like that. Um, and, um, wow, I even have like a little, uh, emoji. I don't know what's going on, but, um, <laughs> <That's weird. laughs> yeah, this happened to me the other day. Uh, honestly, there must be some setting in my computer here where all these some balloons appeared. I think I was gesturing wildly. It's sort of like the um, computer thinks I'm celebrating something. Yeah. I don't have anyway. it because yeah, I yeah. Know on, on zoom you can do stuff like that. Yeah. Like, I've got to figure out. Up, yeah. Like you've got <laughs> yeah, something anyway. on you. Yeah. Got something going there. Some, um, I don't know if it's a beneficial trait, but whatever it is. Um, so the, um, but anyway, the, you know, there's these sort of implausible ideas of like, you know, 5,000 years ago, there probably weren't farmers or populations that were sort of bringing together potentially their Tia Sente on the way to becoming maize. And so th that, that's how they sort of prioritize the graph that they propose. Um, and so, <clears throat> again, they can, you know, use some of this information, this genetic information, population genetics information, to predict that, uh, that um, you know, that all of this was happening, the hybridization or the admixture 
Mexicano is happening about 5,000 years ago. And what's interesting, from a, again, from the sort of archaeological standpoint, is that's right when all of a sudden uh, evidence of increased cob size um, and more uh, seeds or kernels per row on the cob, that really starts to be evident um, in the, you know, in the uh, historic record as well. And so it's kind of a nice correlation. It's right. Like, wh what was it that made that Mexicana admixture so important um, in the entire history of uh, uh, leading up to and including modern corn, modern maize? And it's probably, you know, that's kind of their best guess, right, is that this was a massive improvement in corn and cob size in the amount of kernels that you'd get. And of course, for each ear of corn, um, that's a that's kind of a huge deal. If um, you, you can grow, let's say the cob is twice as big or there's twice as many kernels, you can grow half as many plants to get the same yield. And so this is, you know, underlining, obviously, some pretty obvious principles of, of agriculture. Um, so then, you know, if, kind of going back to the, the map, they can now look at, um, or, or sorry, going back to the genome, they can really zoom in, start to zoom in on where are the regions that the Mexicana contributions, genetic contributions are found? And can they actually go from that sort of correlative view to um, finding candidate regions of the genome where that ongoing genetic contribution continues to be selected, right? These are the, this is still going on year by year. Um, we're, we're now putting our thumb on the scale in a different way with a lot of genetic engineering and GMO, genetically modified organism related corn, all of the controversy that sort of brews, uh, brews around that. Um, but nevertheless, there's still new, you know, people, there are plenty of humans who are continuing to try to improve and squeeze disease resistance, efficiency, et cetera, out of the, the corn. And so, um, so what they do is they use their they start to compare the genomes again of unadmixed parvoglumus. So one so um, lines of maize that um, I think South American ones in particular that don't have any evidence of Mexicana, and start to compare. And so um, which regions are have that Mexicana contribution? Again, about twenty percent show up, and um, uh, evidence for ongoing gene flow. There's still uh, interbreeding going on or admixture. Um, as um, uh, and, and some of this, honestly, I'm guessing uh, they don't address this, and, but it might even um, involve cases where um, I don't know if you've actually, actually grown corn. If it's an open pollinator, um, you, you, you're advised to just plant one strain. Like if you mm -hmm. get your seeds from a local seed catalog or a big seed catalog, because what will happen is you'll, you'll do a hybridization experiment like in real time between and sometimes the you know, the output isn't sort of what you're bargaining for. The yeah. corn might not taste very good, or you might just get really weird kind of mutant ears or something like that. So <laughs> ongoing gene flow, right? So there's still contributions from wild grasses, right? Mm. Wild tiacente, modern ones into corn background leading right up to today. Now, I think in the last maybe 50 years, hundred years, um, how farmers like uh, have the kind of the technology to, and how, and probably more than that, some of the massive, um, you know, seed companies in the, the Monsanto's agribusiness companies out there, the Monsanto's, et cetera, um, have sort of taken control over seed stocks and um, things like that. It might, again, sort of change the, the playbook a little bit, but, but certainly up until even recent times, the properties of open pollination in corn includes, I think, some of these wild contributions, um, evidence for on ongoing gene flow. So um, some interesting maybe tidbits from that analysis. So the most of the regions that are sort of that you can specifically identify as being contributed by Mexicana um, are about 10 kilobases long, 10,000 letters of DNA code. Um, that suggests it's pretty ancient because usually when you do, you know, if you think about a, let's just think about a single interbreeding event, right? Where it's the pollen from Mexicana hits the, um, you know, the developing ear or what will become the ear of um, corn, of, of maize, maybe of the hybrid that's already part of the way down the road. About half the contribution will be from each in that case. As recombination sort of whittles this back, the fact that these are only 10 KB regions, that kind of points back to that 5,000 year ago sort of pivotal event um, in the ongoing domestication of corn. There's also some really cool like inversions. So these are like bigger sort of genome structures where you're walking along the genome, all of a sudden there's a region where it's like, looks like it's been flipped. It's been inverted relative to sort of the, um, the you know, the reference genome um, of corn. And so th this is really interesting to evolutionary geneticists because 
that has some real implications. So if all of a sudden the letters are just reversed in a region, mm-hmm. it means that recombination. So to, as um, reproduction is happening, as meiosis happens, the um, the um, mixture of contributions from the the two parents um, of of that breeding event. Um, if there's inversions, that actually restricts the ability of recombination to happen if there's sort of incompatible regions, because a lot of this mm. homo- so-called homologous recombination depends on there being the same sequence so that the DNA kind of lines up, crosses over, but you, an inversion um, causes that not to happen. Those things can then themselves be selected on um, if they encode, sort of lock in a potentially beneficial code. And so there's a lot of action, I would say, in evolutionary genetics, thinking about the impact of inversions, what that means um, for sort of evolutionary advances um, with with functional impact. And that kind of gets to the last, I would say, major point here, um, just from the population genetics analysis, which is, you know, why did this, so as they're mapping all of these regions of Mexicana contributions, um, you know, why does that matter? What's the functional significance of that? Certainly some of it's going to have no functional significance at all. This is just like the randomness of, mm-hmm. of breeding and genetic drift. And there can still be, you know, super important regions of the genome, but they're no better or worse, whether it's from Mexicana, Parvaglumis, another contribution from a different Z maze um, subspecies. Um, and so they've, you know, used some tools um, here. Um, and I think in a nice way, like really take advantage of the f- fact they have these massive data sets now, a thousand of genomes, um, to look at down to the individual gene level and what are the allele frequencies based mm-hmm. on the differences that you see. And so, you know, the implication there is that if it's a high allele frequency of, say, you know, the, the variance of that in that gene that would be in the, the Mexicana background, that that has now kind of comes to dominate all of the sampling from all over. Mm-hmm. Americas and around the world as the, as corn has really taken off. And so um, they can point to some functions actually. So um, both disease resistance, which they don't go into a lot here in this paper, but mm-hmm. they do focus more on floral morphology. And so in this case, the flower, I guess, I don't, I mean, my corn biology is a little rusty to say the least, but the, you know, the tassels and the kernels and everything else coming together um, and in particular sort of the timing um, of this. So like when, when does the equivalent of flowering happen and how does that sort of um, lead into the um, good outcomes in terms of cob size, number of kernels per row, et cetera. And so there's one gene in particular that they looked at that has, it's almost 90% of it is from the Mexicana background. Um, and they used, this is the great thing about maize too, is it's, it's a genetic model system. You have all these tools, CRISPR based tools. So you can edit the genome based on, you know, sort of this uh, serendipitous uh, immune function, the immune system of bacteria um, to contend with viruses has now been repurposed. And now we can um, both knock in and knock out genes. They did mm-hmm. both here using CRISPR, CRISPR knockout and then alterations for overexpression to test the impact uh, of or the potential impact, whether there is an impact, if you have the Mexicana variant of the gene in your corn background versus no, um, and so the uh, and they show some data. So they grew, they did the genetic engineering um, with that information they gained as a candidate gene. They find that if they knock out the gene, that the um, the corn from that has earlier flower, flowering times and long day conditions. And the opposite is true if they overexpress the gene. It has later flowering uh, time. So they don't, I don't, I would say they don't link that all the way to that, like, okay, what's the, the sort of um, ultimate outcome of that? What does that mean for like yield of kernels, et cetera? Um, but they do hold that up as a, like a pretty cool prediction that's then borne out in some real differences, a, a real phenotype. And by the way, that's not always the case. So I think they don't really go into depth, but they picked a couple other candidate genes where they did this, where they don't see any difference. So whether you have the Mexicana kind of background or mess with it, doesn't matter for like everything that they, it looks like kind of the same corn um, either way. Um, and so, you know, in the end, I think like, and by the way, like big credit for this is like, I think what's really exciting about this, this paper is, and um, Jeff Rossabara had a great, I didn't read it deeply, but he had a Twitter sort of feed thread mm-hmm on this uh, and on blue sky as well. Um, and he mentioned, I think they started this project right when he opened his lab, which was like more than 10 years ago, I believe. And so it's, this is a, like a really great example, I think of slow science, Vincent, where, mm. you know, it's not kind of rush it to the publication with it, the minimal publishable unit. It's to like build up hundreds of genomes to do all of this analysis, to then go in do the experiments to test the prediction of 
you know, the patterns that you see in the genetics in order to, to try to tease out um, what these contributions might look like. And so um, a huge credit for that, kind of the patience to see a study like this through. And then I think kind of in a bigger picture, why does this matter? You know, I mean, of course, uh, understanding with a, um, how we might even now use this information to make corn better using some of the genetic tools that are possible, kind of a fine scalpel approach to um, changing the genetics. But, it's, but there's a bigger point here, which is so, you know, as geneticists, we think a lot about genome-wide associations when we think about, for example, human disease. What are the mutations that have these disease outcomes? And what we've been pretty successful at, honestly, is to, for simple uh, diseases that involve a genetic contribution, if it's a big effect, we've kind of identified that. We have this sort of this thousands of cases where we can hold up and say, okay, if you have these symptoms and this genetic background, these things are probably linked based on these associations. What this work with maize that does though, is like these traits are now um, not as big effect. They have more genetic contributions, but this kind of analysis gives us sort of a new view or new tools to understand how to actually take and uh, make these um, sort of level of analysis a lot stronger. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about when I say we need to hire plant geneticists and human genetics mm -hmm. to that conversation, like the ability to do this kind of work and to see these genetic patterns and link it to these outcomes, not possible um, if we just think about our own species, but conversations between plant geneticists and human geneticists working on humans, like, my God, this is like, um, you can, I think you can just sort of like add rocket fuel um, to genetic research that way. Well, also, it impacts human health. So it's silly to think it doesn't, right? Absolutely. Because you're yeah. not working on humans doesn't mean you're not going to impact human health. So I Couldn't wanted agree. to men mention that you were talking about phenotypes that associated yeah. with uh, Mexicana. And so this is a good summary. They say, we estimate that Mexicana admixture explains a meaningful proportion of the additive genetic variation for many traits, including 25% for the number of kernels per row, 15% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. for plant height, 10% for flowering time and 15 to 50% for disease phenotypes. So these are the things they were selecting for. They were trying to breed to, to improve these qualities. So obviously number of kernels per row, right? You want to have more kernels because that's what you're eating in the end, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so there you go. So that's like, that's, that's what I'm talking about too, right? So that's, those contributions are, are numerous smaller yeah. contributions yeah. that don't make the, you know, it's not a hundred percent kernel per row or number, you know, it's a, it's sort of this sort of great gradation along the way. And just having those insights like this, um, really important, not just for maize domestication, but also just, um, genetic approaches in general. I think okay. we have, we have a question here. Oh, let's, good. Uh, yeah. Let's take a look. Let's see here. Okay. This one, Don says, is it possible that any of the important genes in corn came from retroviruses? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. So, um, <laughs> They don't go into that um, there, uh, but th the answer is um, s sort of. So we mentioned this just uh, maybe, um, I think I mentioned Barbara McClintock a, a, a little ways back as we were just introducing corn um, kind of in the whole genetic landscape. And so, um, you know, these transposable elements, these jumping genes, this is um, uh, the move between species and um, beyond just corn. Um, in these cases, like, yes, though, th these are like virus like contributions or virus like behaviors of genetic sequences of DNA sequences, um, that very much have this, um, viral, um, property to it where it's, you know, selfish replication, jumping genes, also selfish genetic elements is another sort of way that th these are framed, um, specifically retroviruses. I don't know the answer to that. I think the answer might be no, but that the trans, there are some transposable elements that come pretty close mm -hmm. to those kind of, um, you know, re the, the, um, retro of retroviruses is reverse integration where you have intermediates from RNA going back to DNA. Um, and I think you have, you, you have that and more with some of the transposable elements, um, in the way that these things are propagating, how these things propagate is another fascinating, um, topic that we, um, pick up and, and carry around in my lab as well. And so the viruses, I think have a big say in this too, as potential vectors, um, for transposable elements, how does a transposable element get out of a genome and move to another, if it doesn't encode all of the things that a sort of a full blown virus has, it can kind of hitchhike a ride along the way. 
Um, and so I think there's all, yes, all kinds of backstories here mm. involving diversification, both um, facilitated indirectly and directly by viruses and the transposable elements that are part of the con genetic conversation, if you will, as well. Yeah. All right, one Great more question. From, yeah. from Don. Does the genetic analysis compare all the genes in the corn genome or just in some particular part? Do they account for expression? Yeah, so what they're doing is they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're, they're taking a um, kind of an agnostic view. So for example, this, um, uh, uh, some of the analysis here is basically looking for peaks of, because they're really focusing on that con that admixture contribution from Mexicana. And so there, whether it's a gene, coding gene or not, doesn't really matter. It's like, is there a peak that comes up? And so then it's kind of, so and you get, the answer is yes. And there's like thousands of them. There's lots of them, obviously. It's a massive genome. And so then they kind of prioritize it with in areas like with candidate genes, where it's a coding region, et cetera. Um, and take advantage of what's already known about some of the um, functional genetics that have been that's been going on in corn for decades, and maize for decades. But you're but it's a good point because you know it's a, still a pretty limited view, and so um, that's kind of one of the interesting things I think about genetics in general is that like this balancing act between sort of discovery, largely in these days on the genome scale, like uh, this is a nice example of that, versus our, our discovery versus our like understanding or the reach. And so when you're faced with, um, you know, let's say 5,000 interesting signals and you can only study so many things as one lab or whatever, you'll still publish all of that. But then there's like a prioritization that goes on where it's like, well, we already know a little bit about this. So can we say something new about this function? And so as scientists, we sort of circle around a pretty small set of genes in the end or genetic regions and genomes. And most of this is still like a vast landscape of undiscovered important biology, um, which is kind of interesting. It's sort of like, um, yeah, this paradox, I think, of, of modern research and, and how do we balance that is, is an important important question. So I, so um, the answer is they're all over the map, looking all over the genome, looking for interesting signals, but they're pretty limited um, in sort of lifting up a couple where there's something known, which which is much more related to the, the coding region for these genes. Now, dare I say that that was an amazing paper? <laughs> Oof, yeah. We're, oh, and actually, I'm glad you said that because so Jeff... Ross Ibarra is famous for his, like his, um, he's a connoisseur of science puns. And so mm. if you follow uh, him on social media platforms, you'll like within a couple of posts, you'll hit a, uh, you know, pretty, depending on your taste and puns, you'll hit something that's like, real, like a gold mine or a total groaner, like the amazing uh, uh, notion that you're putting forward here. But yeah, I mean, he's next level into puns. It's worth just following his account, just like whether you like puns or not, it's, it's wild. His colleague, uh, Graham Coop and him can have almost like science pun offs together, which are um, either like fingernails on the chalkboard or just like the most clever si situation you've come across. I don't know where I fall on that um, <laughs> register, somewhere in the middle. I, I can oops appreciate a good pun, but um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway. Um, so the, let's, let's close this one out kind of in the interest of time here too. We have a whole nother paper in our double header, our holiday spectacular, um, <laughs> <Tweet> vote 96. <laughs> um, so then the authors, I think kind of set up a great segue for us here. They say that there's likely similar interesting and complicated histories for other crops, rice, tomatoes, barley, et cetera. And so Vincent, you came across this great paper, uh, origin and evolution of domesticated bananas. Um, that came out, I think, a week later. Here we are. Um, some overlapping genome scale analysis. We've moved from to another dominant, like, massive crop here um, uh, uh, that, of course, we're all familiar with is bananas. And so um, this article takes some overlapping, um, you know, approaches and um, genome scale analysis, but it's a much more limited framework, actually. And so I think this will be in the end. We'll, 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 we'll step through the paper, probably take a little less time just in the interest of time to cover the data here, but try to hit the high, we'll try to hit the highlights, the high points, um, and then compare the two, because um, I think that's kind of an interesting um, situation as well. So, okay, let's just set the stage here with some of the important details. So it turns out, and I didn't know this, this is all, um, this is why um, doing this is so much fun, but most fresh bananas belong to either the Cavendish or the Gros Michel subgroups. Michel, Michel. Michel, sorry. Okay, thank you. The Gros Michel subgroups. 
That's important. <laughs> here, here we report chromosome scale genome assemblies of Cavendish, which is one and a half gigabases, about half the size of our own genomes, and uh, Gros Michel, one and a third uh, gigabases, defining three subgenomes. This is BAN, DH, and Z. So this is getting at sort of, again, a complex sort of admixed history here. Um, with Musa acuminata, uh, uh, species Banksii, Malachensis, and Zebriae as their, as their major ancestral contributors. And so that's kind of what we've been talking about, Parva glumis and Mexicana for the last hour. Now we're moving into these, th these are the other three, Von, DH, and Z. Um, that are then um, sort of the genetic underpinnings or the ancestors of these current modern day strains or ascensions of bananas, the Cavendish and the Gros mm -hmm. Michel. So when I go to a supermarket, how do I know which one I'm getting? Yeah. So I think if it's, um, I, I don't know, but I think if they actually give their, you can find out pretty easily and because there are, mm -hmm. there are like real differences here. I think the Cavendish is a thinner skin. Mm -hmm. Um the uh, Gromy shell, I think, is thought to have a creamier texture. It's a, or you know, it's a more sort okay. of tasty, uh, more rich flesh to the banana. There's also differences in so, but but then now there's all this interbreeding, crossbreeding, admixture, and so it gets more complicated in a hurry. And so, yeah, it could, it probably depending on where you are in the. So I think you know, major supermarket chains are probably all kind of in the same as we're going um, here in the U.S. and probably getting dull bananas or whatever it is from our supermarkets just probably all in the same yeah. um, okay. but as you're moving around the world or going to your fancy you know organic supermarkets definitely some differences here so um, uh, now the the genome is triploid so there's three copies correct. right of each chromosome yeah and that's important so that's like kind of high degree of difficulty for genome scale analysis here. And again, so like, you know, why is this paper kind of a big deal? And in part, <clears throat> it's because they really did high quality gene, triploid genomes mm -hmm. using the increasingly powerful um, long read sequencing technologies. So PacBio, um, uh, high C technology. So trying to actually get you know, information about not just the kind of sequences, the sequences, but how are the genomes organized um, even within like the the nucleus um, of a banana uh, cell. And so, um, yeah, and and so um, that's really kind of what, what they've advanced here. But this paper, a little more limited framework, so it's really, you know, a more recent banana do domestication. We don't have, they don't bring in sort of that archaeologic record like we did in the last paper. Um, and, um, but, mm -hmm. but kind of a tour de force, I would say, of like, of like improving a genome. So, I, and actually some more just like, I think fascinating tidbits. I didn't know this, but I guess bananas are technically a, a perennial herb. Um, we're now, <laughs> we're, we're, we're now longer in um, North America, Central America, we're in tropical and subtropical regions. Mm -hmm. One of the most, obviously one of the most productive fruits in the world. Um, now, and I, what I like about this paper is the authors like immediately jump into one of the key traits here, which is disease resistance. And so a massive ongoing issue with um, bananas in the domestication over the last decades has been um, wilting disease. This is caused by a fungal pathogen, mm. um, Fusarium oxysporum. And, um, you know, just as um, breeders are inbreeding their plants, spending a lot of time, you know, generation to generation here to grow the um, trees that will have bananas on them, um, you know, imagine then they all get wiped out by a fungal pathogen. And so, um, so they go ahead, they get their sort of high degree of difficulty genomes, and then they embark on a five genome comparison, less than the thousand genome comparison that we saw before. Um, but this actually, you know, gets at sort of those contributions again from those what they call three subgenomes um, that then go into these sort of these ascensions or varieties that are like have become really popular or successful as um, fresh bananas for food. Um, and, and don't do as much sort of population genetics. So the focus here is kind of more trait related on that wilt resistance. And then they do consider some, um, fruiting traits, which obviously are a massive impact as humans are saying, I want, you know, this really great tasting banana, um, that like grows big or quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So the gene in particular, um, that they by focus the way, on, is, by the way, Nels, yeah, yeah, yeah. the contributors to this, these cultivated bananas are diploids. Correct. Yes. So what's going on there? 
Well, so my, yeah, so there's diploid. So the ancient species are diploid. That's, and by the way, so just, so we're all on the same page here. That means they have two copies of every chromosome. That's what we have in our cells, one from our father, one from our mother. Um, most of some of these ancient strains or species of bananas, the same situation. Um, but then I think a lot of the domesticated bananas are, are like quite polyploid. And so that's something that I think, you know, kind of can come out of, um, uh, these sort of inbreeding programs um, as humans, again, are kind of putting their thumb on the scale of what would uh, otherwise happen mm -hmm. with wild sort of integrations or um, hybridizations or interbreeding. Um, and then you like there's, um, you know, we, we also like do a pretty good job if we're excited about, a, you know, if we have a strain of bananas, that's like super delicious. Like we care for these things. We try to, you know, we keep them away from, we, <laughs> we value them. And so we try to keep them same thing we do with like lab mice. We, you know, right that we try to keep them in sort of controlled environments and that can have some genetic consequences. Um, it can have all kinds of consequences. And so that's in these sort of more complicated polyploid genomes. It's not just triploids, but I think there's other ploides out there. Then for some reason, and I don't, and no one I think was selecting or thinking about this and the domestication of bananas, but it was this, these triploid strains that sort mm. of came on to dominate. And in fact, there's, you know, so now you have contributions um, uh, uh, up from these other sources with up to three copies. And so that kind of, you know, maybe it speaks to a little bit of the genetic flexibility where these contributions can persist and then get expressed. And actually they look at that. We'll circle back to that. Um, okay, kind of Nels, now I got to bring up this joke. Look at this. <laughs> we'll be the last of them, bananas. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There you go. <laughs> that's great. So the... Um, the, so going back to the disease resistance here, mm. there's a gene called RGA2. And so we're going to, we have to navigate a little bit of alphabet soup here. So, um, N NBS LR LRR gene, a nucleic acid binding sequence, leucine rich repeat immune defense gene. And Vincent, I don't know how much time you've spent considering the immune systems of plants, but it is spectacular. <laughs> it is absolutely wild out there. I mean, the immune defenses, we know just like a fraction of what we know about our own immune systems. Mm. But they're, inc they're just so incredible. So, um, so, <clears throat> nucle so nucleic, nucleic acid binding, that implies that there's some sensing here as foreign DNA from a fungal pathogen, for example, shows up in the cytoplasm of a banana cell. Pretty soon, there are hundreds of genes that are sensing that they're binding that foreign, sensing and sort of um, discerning that this is foreign nucleic acid, there might be a pathogen replicating in the cell. Then this kicks off a response. So the leucine rich repeat also can be sensing different sort of forms or, you know, other mm. sort of molecules or properties of the invading cell, the fungal pathogen cells, the virus, the bacteria, um, and then responding. And so there's um, hundreds of these genes. So there's also, there's, um, they just mentioned one other uh, RLP gene. This is a um, receptor like protein. So again, kind of, um, uh, that hinting at the importance of receiving a signal or recognizing a danger signal. And then there's also these massive families of receptor like kinases. And so just from the um, genome analysis they did, I think they found 296, um, uh, yeah, 300 plus of these LRR genes, 252 RLPs, the receptor like proteins, and almost 2,000 receptor like kinases that in some form or another are devoted to immune defenses. So you sense something and then you, re you respond. There are all kinds of these great stories. We don't have time to do it justice, but you know, of decoys where you fool, like, so then the pathogen responds and like tries to turn down the sensor, but the host has a decoy and it's like sort of um, springs a, tr a molecular trap for the, for the incoming pathogen. So the important thing here is that the RGA2 gene, this is really like in the, in some variants of it can be really effective in stopping this particular wilting disease from this particular fungal pathogen. And this, these, you know, these bananas have it, um, and, and gain, and then what they can do with these comparisons is say, well, where did you get it from? And, mm -hmm. and are there sort of unique features that are being potentially selected on in real time? These are the bananas that, that, you know, make it because they don't get wiped out by the wilting disease. And so they note there's a 200 um, repeat base or base pair region, 200 bases, 200 letters um, that are not in the gene itself, the immune gene, but are upstream and probably influence its expression. It, it probably turns it up 
if you have this. And so, again, that wasn't like purposefully bred in, but has appears or has some signals that it might be selected on because it sort of increases that disease resistance. And so there's all of these so kind of far apart in terms of that massive genomic landscape, but just these little hints of like, mm -hmm. okay, this is probably contributing to these important traits that are either being selected on because of things like, you know, the banana just tastes good or the banana survives kind of up against all of the pathogens that it faces. Um, and so that was the kind of the last um, topic that they consider is fruit ripening. And, and here they're able to do some, um, you know, so, so like those three subgenomes, the three species that contributed historically, the ancestors of modern um, domesticated bananas, um, they can say, you know, based on what we know about some of that signaling, um, that the this is the subgenome that sort of contributed the specific genetic variants that might be favorable or have been selected on favorably. And, and the Z genome, the Z E genome subgenome was um, sort of, so to speak, appears to be like in the driver's seat in terms of the contributions for genetic resistance to the fungal pathogen. The band subgenome, on the other hand, appeared to be more um, represented in these genes that are involved in the ripening of the fruits. So I love that, like in their, um, they close in their um, abstract with a, a sentence about like, well, so why does this matter? Why, you know, what's the value of doing all this genomic analysis? And they, and, you know, they're starting to point to it, but the, the hope is that, you know, now you can take this information and go from the domestication of the banana to the phrasing they use, which is the super domestication of the banana, where again, right? So you're using the knowledge of the genetics that you gain from doing this analysis, some of the new tools of genetics to then go in with a scalpel and say, let's just put in this variant of a gene and see, you know, all of a sudden there's this like super delicious banana, but no one eats it or grows it because it's going to get wiped out. But if you put in this resistance gene, all of a sudden mm. you've opened up, right, the market um, to your extra tasty banana that now enjoys resistance I to a fungal pathogen. Nels, I just wonder how much pushback it will get, right, from there's a huge non-GMO movement. So correct. Like, and so, what are you gonna yeah. Do? I know. And so this, you know, I hope actually that these kind of papers maybe, or, you know, if we, I don't know where the, where, how, the right way to have this conversation, but the idea is that like what these papers are doing, especially the one on maize is they're basically saying, you know, compare Tia Sente 6,000 years ago, or even Tia Sente today to corn today, that's genetically modified. It's humans, you know, it's very sort of trial yeah. and error yeah. intuition. But guess what? We ended up with a genetically modified organism. Tiacente is now maize based on thousands of years of interbreeding. To me, that like ethically or fundamentally doesn't feel any different than us going in and saying, OK, you know, now that I know that um, uh, instead of going through like 100 generations of breeding to get this like, to intergress or get this one gene sort of uh, fixed into the population, what if I just use that genetic tool and just put that in tomorrow? Yeah, like. Yeah. I've now saved maybe a hundred years of traditional breeding to kind of get to the finish line of where, and remember those intergressed, those intergressed regions of Mexicana, 10 kilobases. That's the same as like a lot of the genetically modified um, interventions that we're proposing is let's put in 10 kilobases of that disease resistance gene, et cetera. Now, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of room here for the um, darker angels of human intervention, uh, agribusinesses, um, sort of impulse for profits over health or control of a, a resource. Um, I think that's, I don't think there's anything new there. I think it's just maybe these tools make it a little harder to sort of fight against that or, you know, and, and so we need to be better. I think as a society, I think for me at least, not taking GMOs off the table, but how we regulate or manage them becomes, uh, you know, pretty vital and, and on a time scale that has to happen faster than it would otherwise traditionally. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think there's not really any difference between slow breeding and recombinant DNA. In the end, you get similar output, right? Yeah. And there's another, you know, there's another part of this conversation that I think sometimes gets pushed to the edge too, which is um, we've, as a species, we've invented some new problems that we've, you know, that we're we might make sort of technological interventions that aren't per, like create their own new problems. There's nothing new to that. But when we think about how do we feed the world based on, you know, climate, like in a world of ch climate change, you know, if we can do a genetic modification, that means that corn can now grow with half the amount of water or at a temperature limit that, you know, is uh, 
more favorable to current climatic conditions, that might be sort of our best hope for, you know, um, for moving forward in a, uh, in a somewhat positive way versus sort of the headwinds that we face. There's also, you know, there's some cases in rice, the, the golden rice, where putting in a gene that encodes part of the synthesis mm -hmm. pathway for, for vitamin that's missing in a lot of yeah. diets of people around the world. And, and I think there's, you know, stories about this in India where like um, fields of this rice is planted and then burned by people, but um, so that it can't come to market or can't be harvested because it's of this, the, you know, fear of GMOs. Whereas if you would have, as you know, a pharmacist just squeezed that vitamin on top of the rice, we wouldn't blink an eyelash. But the fact that it's somehow encoded in the genome has made it this, you know, scary kind of monster. And so, yeah, so I think this is like, I'm, I'm definitely not trying to um, just say, oh, take GMOs and it should be fine. That's not what I'm saying. But I think, um, yeah, it's an important conversation to have. And honestly, the, um, the history that we have as humans has led us here today. We, I think the tool, and so I think from a kind of philosophical standpoint, the impulse is no different. It's just the technology is different and sort of the structure of patents, as you're pointing out, and um, how we regulate or don't regulate this has, has put us into some pretty tight spots. All right, so Don has a question. Is it known if the regulating region comes from SNPs or from mixing genes, that is from sex, or are there other possible sources of the change in the regulating region? Yeah, so I think all of the above. So I think if we're talking about, um, and depending on which genetic region you're looking at, so <clears throat> um, if we're talking about that 200 base pair insertion, that should repeat insertion, um, that wouldn't be a SNP. That's a bigger kind of structural change. Like on the scale, structural change is quite small, but probably one event where that kind of gets dropped in. But then there's diversification of that at the SNP level. And, and that's where, you know, again, we're kind of brushing over it, but there's all kinds of diversity in the different strains, the different sessions, the different species. And so you can start to kind of get a picture of like how that might be influencing it, where it's shared and where it's different. But yeah, so all of those, the kind of every mechanism of genetic change, I would say, is at play here in the domestication, right. whether it's maize or bananas. Okay. Good question. Yeah. All right, Nels, want to do, want to do some picks? Beautiful. I do. Yeah, um, I'll kick it off here um, if I might. So I've got one that um, I think is pretty great. So this is a um, uh, title of this. It's a podcast um, from the journal Nature, their careers podcast. The title of it's why we need academic, why we need an academic career path that combines science and art. And so there's three people, different career stages that are um, <coughs> sort of promoting this idea that not, and it's not just, you know, the idea that, oh, art could um, mm -hmm. sort of serve science or science could serve art. It's that the, kind of an equal measures that bringing these two disciplines together could really open up some innovation in terms of how we do our science and communicate it as well. And so um, I'm forgetting at the moment um, the players here, but it's someone who runs the Burroughs Welcome Fund and is really kind of championing this idea. There's someone at Stanford um, uh, who's... Uh, also like, as taking this as a career path um, and a third person involved here. So um, I just started listening to the podcast this morning. I haven't had a chance to really digest it, but I'm count me in. I, I really like this idea of thinking broadly um, about how art and science actually have overlapping kind of principles that sort of drive them. Creativity being an obvious one um, in both of those fields, um, but also trying to think about how we kind of carve new room um, to not sort of have like, oh, let me be sort of an artsy scientist or um, vice versa, but to really bring these two kind of, to, to bring these sort of very, what seemingly seem like separate disciplines together and see what that means if, if, there, if, if that's mm -hmm. possible and, and what the outcome is kind of into the future. Well, I mean, now we're doing art, right? <laughs> that's generous. Um, I think the closest I've come is a great, and you've um, interviewed Janet Owasa on, on TWIV, I think uh, once or twice, is my colleague here in biochemistry who's a molecular animator. Um, and the level of the sophistication of the animations and the artistry in that, I think is a great example of this. And, but that's just one, I think, sort of expression. No, no. Of how, yeah. I think a podcast is a form of art. To do it is, is expressing science in a different way. And I think that's art. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you. I've been kind of ruminating on I, I kind of how, how like, so 
is this like kind of long form stand up poetry? That's maybe a generous interpretation, but actually bringing in some of the principles of poetry to try to explain science so that it kind of touches us as humans in a way that might be a little more mm -hmm. impactful. Right. And I think, yeah, I think we're like, we're, we're kind of nibbling around on that too. Um, but yeah, the, I think um, bringing that sort of the artistry to the next level is a pretty interesting, uh, yeah, pretty interesting prospect um, in, for the future. Vincent, how about you? What is your science pick of the All right, I, have, I have two because one Great. of them is in honor of uh, one of our papers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a restaurant here in, in the DC area called MAIZ64, Maze 64. Yes. And that's, I, I went there some time ago and I asked the guy, what, what's the name? And he said, well, there's 64 varieties of maize in Mexico. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. I mean, they, and if you go to the website, you'll see a nice picture of maize right there of the dark kernels and the mixed dark yeah. and light. Very pretty. Awesome. Uh, you got to go, go back and tell them there's like a, there's more a paper. Than a thousand. <laughs> yeah, <that's right>. yeah. <laughs> but it is, uh, they, they celebrate, you know, authentic Mexican cuisine, not not fast food, okay, real yeah, yeah. Mexican cuisine, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's very very good. I highly recommend it. But it's nice. it's relevant to our paper. Um, yeah, my my pick is so th so every year Science Magazine does um, a couple of things. They do uh, science breakthroughs and breakdowns. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, that's really pretty good. And so. Um, let me see if I can. The breakthrough this year. Let me find it. Here we go. Mm -hmm. um, the breakthrough is a um, a drug for obesity, which apparently is yep. really really amazing and and works very well and so forth. Uh, so that's very cool. But then there's the breakdowns of the year, and uh, this includes um, the Antarctic meltdown. Yeah. Right. Which is big problem. Um, stuff happening. I mean, all the controversy, which is manufactured controversy about the COVID, SARS-CoV-2 origins, right? Yeah, Leading yeah. to hearings and politicization, whereas one party, you know, makes inquiries, you know, Republicans have uh, accused U.S. health officials of concealing a lab leak in order to to cover up yeah. U.S. funding for bad, you know, all this BS for which there's no evidence whatsoever. So that's another that's right. breakdown. Breakdown, yeah. Yep. Uh, another one is uh, superconductor claims that turn out not to be. Oh, uh, I remember that correct, one. Yeah, the right? splashing. That was kind of not a surprise that that evaporated. Yep. yep. And finally, research on Twitter goes down the drain. Mm, true. Where, yep. um, you know, Twitter used to be a good place for scientists to talk. Yeah. Um, and many of them have now left because he has made uh, yep. changes, including restricting access to data. Twitter, yeah. Twitter was one of the few places where they allowed you to have data uh, on That's what's right. happening there. And they've, they've shut that off now. And mm. so uh, it's, a, it's really unfortunate because yeah. a lot of people were there and now he has really <laughs> trashed it. And I'm not sure what. what yeah, Blue Sky. Doing. There's a little resurgence at Blue Sky, but it's, it's pretty limited. Yep. It says here, some have set up digital camp at alternatives like Mastodon, Blue Sky, Threads, but um, it's really fractured now, right? We, ha we don't have uh, the same kind of solidarity that we, that we had been then. And um, let's see here. Nels, where'd you go? <laughs> okay, I can talk without Nels. Don says yes to Vincent being an artist. I mean, I think Nels and I are artists. I think people doing podcasts are artists because it's a form of expression, right? Any form of expression is uh, an art form. And we just happen to be expressing about science, I'm not making any highfalutin claims. I'm just saying it's a, it's a kind of art form. And I think it would go well next to other art forms. For example, to have a show where you have an artist and us on stage and we can talk about science and then the audience Vincent, sorry about, about that them. no worries I had a little lab uh, uh small emergency there someone just yelled out that there was alarm going off but 
turns out it's just a, a <laughs> minus 80 freezer. Yeah, that happens. Everything is just fine. So you but, see what Don said yes to Vincent being an artist. I was just saying that I think <laughs> we are expressing, so we're artists, and I, I thought yeah. it would be cool to have a show one day where we do something next to an artist. You know, an artist can talk about their work, and we can talk about science next to each other. I think that would be very compatible. I agree. You also have that great uh, um, painting of Ebola virus at the incubator, which I think very oh, yeah. nicely yeah. Uh, covers this um, divide between science and arts. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's a interpretation of a virus by an artist, right? It is exactly. not an accurate drawing. That's not what it's meant to be. It's it's no. that artist's interpretation, just like Michelle Banks makes interpretations of, of viruses when she paints them or neurons yes. or whatever it is, cells. I think that's great, right? Because you can say, you could show that to someone and say, what does it say to you about Ebola virus, right? Um, yep. And I think that's a good way to teach. So. I couldn't agree more. I want to do yep. more of that. And I'm thinking, you know, in my virology class, throw up a painting and say, I mean, not a painting of viruses, just a painting. Yeah. Like an Edward Hopper, with a, sol a solitary person sitting at a, um, a cafe in a city and say to the student, what does this remind you of? And I bet somebody will say lockdown, COVID lockdown, you know, and I want to hear that. I think that's really useful. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. There's also, I mean, there's the whole entry, recent entry of AI into, um, you know, artistic expression, um, which I think is, offers an opportunity to talk about mm -hmm. artificial intelligence in a way that might open up some conversations that could be productive as well. Sure. I just saw one, um, someone asked chat GPT to draw the Beatles drinking tea or something like that. And AI added a fifth Beatle. <laughs> and then, <laughs> cool. and yeah, it's weird. It's kind of weird. And yeah, but um, it just gets you, th it provokes thought and it opens up the way we think, which um, is obviously really important, both for as practicing scientists, but also connecting um, science to, to yeah. uh, society at large. Yeah. Here's a comment from a listener. My father-in-law was a long-term plant geneticist working for USAID and Pioneer Seed, part of the greening of the Indian subcontinent. Amazing yeah. man. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it's in these like genome studies now that like almost the sort of fingerprints of that work starts to, it's, it's in there. And, right. all, uh, you know, I think that's really interesting too, is sort of those like mm -hmm. contributions um, from all over are sort of written into um, human history as well and, sure. and the contributions. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me thank our moderators today. Les, uh, Tom, um, Steph, Barb Mack. Thank you all for, for being here, especially as some of you were here last night on the stream. Thanks everybody for coming today as well. We appreciate yes. your, your, uh, your being here. Um, we'll probably be back in about a month, right? Nels. We will. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I guess that's the sort of magic of live stream podcasting. I might even um, pop out for a pseudo emergency uh, when you least expect it. No, sorry <laughs> yeah, about that. Okay. Kind of a lab lab issue there, but no worries, it's totally no. fine. Everything, everything is good and looking uh, and looking forward already to our next conversation. That'll be Twivo 97, Vincent. 97, three more to a hundred. That's cool. hundred. Very cool. Uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Tuivo. If you really enjoy our work, we'd love to have your support. Please go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Although for the month of December and January, you could go to parasiteswithoutborders.com because Daniel will match your donations to Microbe TV. So that's a very effective way to yeah, support fantastic. us. Fantastic. If you, have, if you have any questions or comments, Tuivo at microbe.tv. Nels Eldes at cellvolution.org. L early bird on Twitter. Do you use the same handle on on uh, Blue Sky? I do. Yep. All right. Slowly um, starting to. I don't know if I'm. I'm kind of starting that transition. Maybe slowly but surely. There could be a catastrophic event at Twitter. It feels like any day. Um, but. <laughs> All right. <laughs> slowly well, thank, rebuilding a network. Thank you, yeah. Nels. Good to see you. Thank you, Vincent. I'm Vincent really Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. Music you hear on Twivo is by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at tramplebyturtles.com. Have a great holiday, everybody. You too, Nels. Yes, you too, Vincent. And to all our listeners out there, happy holidays. Bye.
listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. A little bit too loud there. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, stay curious. Bye-bye.